insect. Its aim uh, purpose is to help emerging space nations to get their first CubeSat. Not fast. I, I, it doesn't have to be fast CubeSat, actually. Anyway, the, we assist emerging countries to get their CubeSat uh, into the lower orbit uh, through the uh, ISS uh, deployment. Okay. So JCube, uh, it sounds similar to the Kubo Cube, but uh, it is different. Kubo Cube, as you may know, uh, it is a, a joint effort between JAXA and uh, UN USA. And it's already done, I think, a six round or seven, seven round. Uh, I don't remember. But anyway, um, it is uh, the, it involves uh, United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs and uh, and the people uh, submit application to UN USA. Okay, and uh, launch cost is free, but uh, it is done by competition. So uh, there will be a competition. Uh, the, so winner will be selected, one or two winners per year. That's for them, keep all okay. yes. Anyway, it, it is free launch, but it is also limited to one year cube. JAXA, uh, JCube is a JAXA and a UNIFEC. UNIFEC is a university space, uh, a university space uh, engineering consortium, yes. And, uh, it is a non-profit organization in Japan, uh, the, in which uh, many Japanese universities who work on uh, practical uh, space engineering education uh, are the member. And uh, JCube uh, is a kind of a uh, another type of low cost uh, launch opportunities. And the program has uh, the two categories. One is uh, the international collaboration framework. Another one is a domestic capacity. Domestic means Japanese. So for you, uh, the first one applies. The second one uh, is not the, your concern. Okay. So first one is a, uh, is a of interest, of your interest. And uh, anyway, these both uh, require some partnership. And for the international fraud, partnership between foreign uh, entity, it doesn't have to be a university actually. Uh, no uh, government organizations or even a company. Uh, yes, I, I don't think uh, we have a st uh, strict uh, criteria for the international partners. Yes. And uh, anyway, but the Japanese universities must be teamed with that one. And uh, JCube winners secure low cost launch opportunities. So it's not for free, but it is drastically uh, cheaper than the market price. Okay. I cannot say how much, but uh, it is way, way cheaper than uh, the market price right now we have. And uh, in one year, there is a uh, capacity of 12 U over six satellites per year. So the satellite size is assumed to be one to three U. So you can launch up to three U cube. For Kibo cube, it is limited to uh, one U. Okay. So to summarize, the difference is a J cube. It's not free, but uh, it is much lower than the market price. Kibo cube is free. And the size of J cube, it is up to three U. Kibo cube, up to one U. Selections, Kibo cube, it's very competitive. Yes. So you may, uh, you may not know whether you secure the drop slot or not after the review uh, is complete. And the J cube, uh, there are some uh, review at the selection committee. So based on that review, uh, it will be uh, selected. Okay. But 
But uh, the chance of getting a launch slot is much, much higher than Kiboti. Requirement uh, is that the satellite must serve uh, uh, the capacity buildings of your country. So that's the one requirement, yes. So purely commercial uh, missions, it's not really good, okay. Also J-Cube, uh, it mandates to team up with a Japanese university. So you, you have to select some Japanese university, yes. And uh, launch method, launch method is uh, yes, uh, it's the same as the cube cube. We use this uh, J sort from international space stations. Okay. I think I can skip this. So to promote this J cube, uh, QTech. QTEC also assist uh, UNICEF uh, of this uh, JCube uh, uh, initiative. And uh, to promote this uh, JCube, uh, we decided uh, to have uh, some kind of a webinar series. So this is the first one. Actually, this JCube started last year. An announcement was done at the uh, UNICEF global meetings and uh, also at the website, but uh, not too many people know. So we decided it's uh, better to, pro to do more promotions uh, to the wider people. So a series of JQ webinars are planned. Uh, today is the first one. Second one is June 22nd. Uh, it's 9 a.m. JFT, so it is targeting uh, the, the Latin American countries. And uh, it will be more to be, uh, to be developed later. Okay. So now uh, I'll talk about the, how the, the what uh, which you should be, you should know uh, when you collaborate with the Japanese universities. QTE has a very good record of collaborating with foreign partners. Uh, the first one is uh, with uh, Singapore. We launched our Berk 3 uh, through the ISS. And uh, we launched BAD series. Uh, up to now, we have launched BAD 1, BAD 2, BAD 3, BAD 4. Also, we have shifted Costa Rica to build their uh, first CubeSat. Uh, so in this case, uh, they built a satellite uh, domestically uh, inside Costa Rica, and uh, they brought uh, the satellite for the final testing and uh, handover to JAXA uh, uh, in Japan at QTEC. And uh, we, we did another Singapore uh, the collaborations. Also, we assisted uh, veterans micro drone, although it was not ISS launch. So in this case, uh, the Hokkaido University, Tohoku University, so five Japanese universities assisted this um, micro drone, not just a QT. Egypt, uh, we assist this NAS Cube one for the, uh, the development. And recently, we assist the Philippines, uh, Maya Free Maya. So in pipelines, we have this Zimbabwe and Uganda, about five, uh, which will be uh, hopefully uh, they, uh, launched uh, this year. And Philippines, uh, Maya five, Maya six, Mexico, Koto, Thailand, Nakfat two. Actually, the number 13, 14, 15 is under the framework of J cube. Yes. Uh, so, Although the AQ was officially announced, not much of the attention uh, in the worldwide. And so we uh, we apply defense and so FIP makes Tyra cut that Okay. Okay. And uh, so why so if you look at this uh, list, uh, QTEC has a very uh, long leg, uh, long uh, record of collaborating with Japanese universities. So why? Because our missions at the laboratory of uh, uh, the satellite. <laughs> laboratory of Lin, uh, the Lin satellite enterprises and uh, in orbit experiment, uh, we call the RASEN. 
And uh, the, our mission of uh, the Rafen's mission is to contribute to the humanity, humanity by bringing diversity to the space sector. Uh, that is our mission. So that's why we, we, we help. So we also help uh, domestic, uh, Japanese uh, universities uh, to enter to the space sector uh, by acute so assisting uh, newcomers entering uh, to the space sector is our mission. So that's why we we do. But uh, you should know that not all the Japanese universities have the same missions. Their missions are different. Their missions is uh, the maybe dedicated to the research and education, purely. And uh, so for each case of collaborations, if you partners with the Japanese universities. Benefits to Japanese universities uh, need to be identified uh, when you find a partner. So I think you need to discuss what kind of benefit uh, they have yes, and also you have. So typical flow of the collaborations. First, you make a first contact either by email or by in, in a conference or some, somewhere in a, there must be some first contact. And then you do the meetings either remotely or in person. And after that meetings, there were lots of uh, many remote meetings and uh, many exchange of emails because uh, you cannot always uh, meet each other in person. And uh, during that process, statement of work, we call S4W, will be formulated. It, it doesn't have to be the official uh, kind of a very formal document. It can be just a uh, simple bread home memos. But uh, it must be clearly says what to do in the collaboration. What is the object, objective of the project? And the responsibility of each partner, each party. And after that, contract is signed. And uh, also money is transferred. Usually from foreign partners to Japanese universities. The opposite, flow, opposite directions is very rare. So usually money comes from foreign partners to Japanese universities. And uh, actual works, students may come to Japan as full-time graduate students or research student, and actually uh, you will build a satellite. And the satellite is delivered to Japan, and uh, it will be launched, uh, delivered to JAXA, and uh, launched and operated. And uh, this number nine may be before number eight, I think it should be before number eight, actually. Discussion on the next collaborative project. So those are the typical flow. Uh, I think we do uh, here at the QTEC, and I think it's a very typical flow. So important point to be remembered, just four points. In person meetings, meeting face to face is very important to know each other. So I suggest utilize conferences such as UNICEF Global or IAC or other conferences uh, to, to meet each other. And a clear definition of responsibility in SOW is very important because uh, the, it is a collaboration between different cultures. In some, in some cultures, the people try to make everything clear. In some culture, some, some ambiguity is allowed, but it is only case when everything's done in the same culture. So, uh, because uh, the uh, two different parties from two different uh, cultures work together, I think uh, defining responsibility clearly is important to have the, uh, the smooth collaboration. Also, uh, be careful about the money transfer. When you transfer the money internationally, uh, we have seen many uh, dramas in the past. And so you need to anticipate many dramas, many delays, and uh, many uh, uh, hurdles, yes. 
And uh, the most important, it shouldn't be the just one time collaboration. Continue the collaborations even after that first satellite project is over. It doesn't have to be the satellite project, but uh, the long term uh, collaborations, the exchange of faculties, students, exchange of uh, peoples, and um, in joint project, other than the satellite or anything. Yes. So don't let it finish as a just one time project. And uh, so also what the Japanese universities want? Uh, universities are not the launch brokers, so they are not doing for money. And uh, you need to, ex they expect to return in other ways, such as students or papers, publications, or others. And they want to leverage the international collaborations to promote globalizations of university research educations and their campus. Or Japanese universities may simply want to lower the launch cost by sharing with a foreign partner. For, for example, proposing to you, CubeSat, when you built by Japanese university, when you built by uh, foreign universities, and uh, apply for JCube. I think it's comp uh, totally fine for that one. So anyway, please note that you are not dealing with a launch brokers. You are, you are uh, dealing with a uh, with a Japanese uh, with a university. Yes. For suggested schemes, uh, good collaboration schemes. It's a joint development of CubeSat, which involves student exchange through the project, and uh, student, uh, both Japanese and non-Japanese, learn how to work with people. From different, uh, from different cultural background. This is the first satellite we work together with the, uh, uh, with the uh, Singapore. This is our very free. We clearly defined our uh, interface. Satellite bus is built uh, by QTEC. Mission payload, in this case, uh, pulse plasma thruster is one you, uh, is built by the Singapore. So we, jo we joined together. And there are some exchange uh, from Japan to Singapore, from Singapore to Japan. Yeah. Other good schemes, satellite is built outside Japan, but the students come to Japan for study. In this way, uh, the students coming to Japan, they can learn satellite development, testing operations by hands-on. And also the student can serve as a liaison with the home countries. This is the case of the uh, case of the Iraz Costa Rica. These two students are the QTEC student uh, coming from Costa Rica. So they are studying at the QTEC, and uh, the person in the middle uh, came to QTEC for the final testings. Uh, he was a student at the uh, Costa Rica. So, but these two, uh, by staying at the Japan while working on the satellite project, they can also learn uh, space engineering. And after they graduate, they can go back and they can contribute their own country. Another one is the satellite is built in Japan by students coming from abroad. So uh, they can learn satellite development testing operation by uh, hands-on. This is the case uh, we use in a BATS uh, program. So this is uh, the group picture of BATS 4. So uh, all of them are actually QTEC students, but uh, uh, they are coming from the each uh, countries of the patterns. So uh, suggestions with the student exchange make the collaborations uh, better and uh, more fruitful. So uh, not simply just uh, sending satellite and uh, doing uh, Testing those other than that, rather than that one, I think uh, exchange of student is better. For student exchange, uh, so I suggest a long term stay, uh, more than one year. And for full time graduate students, it's a good option. And the Japanese university tuition is much lower than the other developed, country, developed countries, like US or Europe. So you can consider that. 
And uh, also to enroll graduate schools in Japan, uh, everybody needs to pass the exam. And in that case, you need to be careful about the timeline. So for October admission, the exam application period is May. Uh, this is the case for QTEC. So it may vary depending on the university. But uh, I think where they are is, so they, I think it can be as early as May. So to send students to Japan, the preparation must start uh, very in advance. Also, uh, this is the last one. As the money transfer occurs in JCube, because it's not for free, because you have to send the money for the launch to a Japanese university. And the Japanese university will make a launch contract with the uh, JAXA. So money has to be sent to your country to Japan anyway. So the, because the money is involved, the contract must be made. Yes, it's, uh, you cannot avoid that one. So once you make a contract, it's legally binding. So you need assistance, assistance from the legal section of your organization. I think this is also true for the QPQ. So uh, the point in the contract, when you make a contract with the Japanese university, uh, these five points uh, needs to be uh, remembered. No military use. I think uh, the every Japanese university write that one. So uh, the, you, you cannot use a satellite for military use. And you are required to register your satellite to United Nations after it is deployed. It's a important, <laughs> important uh, things because uh, JAXA really uh, requests that. And export controls, yes, uh, uh, Japanese image is also under government export control issues. So there are things uh, which uh, university cannot do. Or uh, it may take a long, long time to get a permit. For payment due, please uh, be aware, yes, uh, Japanese university must pay the launch cost to JAXA by certain time, so you have to pay uh, by certain amount. Also payment currency, usually it is in N. For right now, N is very cheap, so <laughs> now it's a good time to do. I think that's it, yes. And uh, do I have a question? Prof. Joe, can you mention uh, first come, first serve? Uh, yes, uh, it's a typically first come, first serve. However, well, there will be some selections. So uh, even if you, sub it's not really guaranteed. Yes. So in principle, it's first come, first serve. But, uh, in, uh, but uh, yes, and it is not really. Yes, there are some criteria to be met. And do we, uh, one question, do we need to take the Nihon language exams? Uh, no. Uh, uh, in QTEC, uh, at least, uh, we, we do not require, yes. Uh, however, many universities will require score of English test, like a TOEFL or TOEIC or Cambridge. So I, I suggest to take that. Yes. Any, Any questions? questions? あ、田中さん、田中さんいたよね。Yes。あの、JCUBEのオフィシャルのウェブサイトのあのアドレスを出しておいてくれますか。チャット。あ、はい、わかりました。あ、うるぷとは JCUBE オプションのウェブサイト
If not, I think I hand over to the uh, Ohosan. Okay, thank you, Professor Cho. Uh, we'll proceed to the second presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me, my doesn't say? Yes, no problem. Okay, I'd like to go ahead and share my screen just a moment. Please go ahead. Okay, is my screen visible now? Yes, it's not full screen, however. Okay, just... <laughs> Just a moment, I'll make it full screen. We, we now have 40 participants, which is pretty good. Okay, so this is um, full screen now, right? Yes, yes it is. Okay, um, good evening, um, good morning, good afternoon, good day, wherever you are, and welcome to this um, webinar. My name is um, Joseph Ampedro Fosu, and um, I work here at the Center for Nano Satellite Testing, which is also part of LASEN. So um, I see that most of the people <laughs> in the, most of the people participating today are from our lab or from QTEC community. So most of them already know what <laughs> we do over here. But for the benefit of those who are not with us and who don't know um, what we do, um, I'll take my time to explain what the Center for Nano um, Satellite Testing is capable of and the kind of services we offer. You may uh, send your questions in the chat anytime. Okay, so this will be the flow of my presentation. Um, I'm going to talk about where we are located and why we test, and then I'll talk a little bit about thermal vacuum test. And then also, um, not only thermal vacuum test, I also talk about um, mechanical tests and then some other um, facility or capabilities that we have. So if you take a look at this uh, map of uh, Japan, this is the Hokkaido Island and then this is the Kyushu main island. And we are located right at the tip of the Kyushu main island. So um, at SENT, SENT was established, this is just a brief history. So SENT was established um, about um, 12 years ago. And um, we are located in um, Tobata campus. Now, um, QTEC has about three campuses and one of them is Tobata campus. And the director of the center is the first presenter for today's webinar, that is Professor Cho. And then the chief technical person is um, Masi Sensei and um, Kano san is the one that handles the administrative task. So um, I won't say this is our main philosophy, but I'll say that one of our philosophies is maintaining the right balance between um, cost delivery time of your satellite, and then also reliability. And um, here we are equipped to test um, nanosats and cubesats up to um, 50 kg or maximum size of um, 50 centimeters. Although sometimes we do test um, satellites that are about um, 100 centimeters in dimensions and sometimes 100 kg, like we are currently doing now, doing right now, in the first floor. So um, these are the services um, we, we, we deliver or we offer. So basically um, thermal cycle and thermal vacuum um, testing. We are also able to do thermal shock. And then we also have outgas um, measurement equipment. And then we can do vibration and shock tests. And then also electromagnetic compatibility tests or antenna pattern tests. Um, we don't have um, TID, total ionization dosage um, equipment, but we can coordinate that. We do that for a lot of users who are outside of Japan. So we can coordinate that and, and handle that testing as well. 
Um, we are also able to offer training services and sometimes training services for, um, for at this facility for environmental testing. So you can have a one week or a two week tutorial whereby you are given the, um, you would have a lecture and then also have hands-on training in the kind of testing that we do. We also offer other services such as um, um, safety review assistance. So let's say you bring your satellite and then it's going to be delivered to JAXA. JAXA would require that we meet certain criteria. And so, um, and to do that, you have to submit documents to show that. And um, it's a stringent process. And so you will need assistance, technical assistance to do that. And we are able to do that as well. So these are some of the things we do here in QTEC. I'd like to also say that um, we have accreditation, especially for our um, vibration equipment. So we are accredited by the Perry Johnson Laboratory and our accreditation, this, is, this picture is very difficult to see, but um, every year we go through um, an examination. Okay. So why um, do we test? Those of us in this community know why we test, but um, before we go on to why we test, I would like to talk about um, the small SATS trend by um, this report is given by the Bryce Tech report. And I think this is their latest report. It was released this year. And according to them, they say that 37% of all small SATs launched between 2010 and 20, um, I think 2010 and 2021, sorry, this is a typo, were launched in 2021. And then also uh, the use of um, commercial of the shelf components are becoming increasingly accessible, affordable, and also reliable. And there is also significant utilization, um, growth in tech and science um, demonstrations, as well as increase in startup companies, and then also increase an increasing trend in capital investment. So um, the categories of small sites being launched yearly are increasing, and um, these do not just get up and they are being launched because if your satellite is not tested and if, if your design specifications do not meet certain requirements, then your satellite will be dead on arrival. As soon as, as, soon as it is released um, in space or deployed from the ISS, uh, maybe it will fail. So that is why, that is what we here at QTEC, I mean necessarily specifically sent, that is what we do to ensure that um, you release um, a system that is capable of withstanding the harsh and sometimes unpredictable environment of space. So I'll go ahead and talk about why we test. So the first reason is to ensure that your system will survive um, the space environment. And that is to verify your system against um, technical requirements, and then also to validate your system against um, user requirements. And then also um, the reason why you would have to test is to show proof of compliance because if um, a launch service provider is going to carry your components as one of their payload, they don't want your system to be um, to be to to have any harmful effect on other payloads or on the other system. And so you have to show proof of compliance. And the only way to do that is via analysis and tests, and then also by submitting. Um, the design specifications that you have in certain certificates that show that your components or your subsystem will be able to meet um, the requirements that are being set by them. So to what do we comply? So every launch service provider um, have their own specifications and um, the, environment, um, the environment of the launch provider differ from other launch providers. And so if you are going to do a direct rocket, rocket launch, it is different from um, your satellite being released um, from the, or being deployed from the ISS. So some of the environments include um, thermal, um, also mechanical, and then also um, you have to deal with um, particle and contaminants, radiation as well, and then also electromagnetic uh, compatibility because um, your, your, your satellite is going to operate 
in a plasma environment, which has um, magnetic fields and electric fields. And then also your antenna that is required to communicate with ground stations would also produce some sort of um, electric and magnetic fields. And so um, you, you need to demonstrate that your system is compatible and would work um, effectively in these environments. So uh, sometimes some launch vehicle providers or services, uh, service providers uh, would require that you go through, you, you do the proof of concept in phases. It depends on the service provider. Others might just want to see only the last state, which is the flight model. So you might have your engineering model or you might have a qualification model or a put of flight model if you don't have a qualification model. Okay, so I'd like to go ahead and explain um, the kind of what, what we do here regarding um, thermal vacuum um, testing. So usually um, in thermal vacuum testing, you, you want to ensure that your system will survive the, um, the cyclical temperature variations in, in space. And the thermal sources uh, are basically radiative. Of course, within your system, it's, there'll be conduction, but uh, between your system and the environment is basically um, radiation because it's vacuum. So heat transfer is, is radiative heat transfer. And then also you have um, solar irradiation and then also albedo from the F. And if you are going to the moon or any other um, extraterrestrial body, then you'd also need to consider the albedo from that body. So for instance, if you'll be going to the moon, then we'll need to consider that. Sometimes too, um, the launch service provider would, would have to uh, describe um, the pressure drop when you are doing the testing because when, when they are launching from launch and then cruising all the way till they release your um, subsystem, they go through stages. So some of them might specify um, the condition at which you should do your thermal vacuum testing, and then also the pressure level. Most of the time, if you are going to operate within um, LEO, then somewhere below 10 to the power minus three and up to about 10 to the power minus five Pascal, is okay. And then also um, you would have to, um, so this is, this is an example of um, um, a profile for thermal vacuum testing, whereby you cycle or you take your components or your system through this series of um, hot cases and cold cases. And then when you get to every hot case or cold case, you soak them for some time. And after that, you perform some functional tests. Okay, so in, um, in QTEC, we, um, uh, we have about three thermal vacuum um, chambers at scent. We have other kinds of chambers as well, but they are not um, thermally equipped. But for, we, have, we have a big uh, thermal vacuum chamber as shown in this picture. Its dimensions are about uh, 1.7 meters in diameter and 1.7 meters in length. And um, it's equipped with a shroud, which um, it's very difficult to see. But if you look at this front panel, you see that this is part of the shroud and it's coated uh, in, in, in black because um, black has a better solar absorptivity and solar emissivity. So, so that's why it's coated with black to enhance um, radiative heat transfer. Okay, so our chamber is equipped with um, a dry pump or a scroll pump. And then also we have a turbo pump and then we have um, a cryo pump. So most of the time we don't need to run all these pumps together, but we always have to run the dry pump because it's a roughing pump. And then we either run the turbo or cryo pump um, depending on the kind of load. And sometimes we run them together depending on the kind of load we have. And then also we have um, a small chamber. So this is the dimensions of our small chamber. Basically we use, we use this chamber to test up to 3U or 2U. 2U. 3U, we cannot use a jig, 
So we have to make use of sheet heaters. But if it is to you, yes, we can use jig. And um, this is also similar to the big chamber in terms of performance and um, pressure, um, pressure levels. So typically, this is how um, the chamber looks like from the outside. And this is the, um, this is the front door of the chamber with the shroud inside. And during a test, typically this is how we set up and we do, we do the test. Okay, so because um, we here at Kintech, um, actually Prof Cho is one of the um, people who spearheaded the study group 4.1a that concluded that, um, um, that concluded or that came up with the idea of the lean satellite concept. And what they stated was that um, um, you, we should be able to achieve high quality at low cost, and then you should have um, a fast system um, for delivery. And then it should be simple, but um, reliable. And then um, it should, we, there should be some, um, there should be some, should I say trade-off between taking risk and then risk mitigation. So we are not like the huge commercial and industrial um, groups. We are um, university folks or sometimes maybe small startups. So you, you don't want to take huge risk, but you can't also avoid risk, okay? So um, at Lasen or at Sense, we promote this concept via the BIRDS projects and other international collaborations as was already introduced in the first presentation. And then also, by the services we deliver at our test facility. Sometimes we don't um, collaborate with people on their satellite, but we have all kinds of um, organizations and institutes and private companies, both domestic and international, coming to use our facility. Sometimes we also do remote testing. During the COVID period, some of our users couldn't come to Japan. So we had to do <laughs> remote testing. It was an interesting experience. So um, we, we, we are interested in developing and test, developing testing systems that are accessible, inexpensive, and then also that will be eventually standardized. So um, I'd like to introduce one of our thermal vacuum testing system. I'll skip the technical details. So we have um, a chamber that doesn't use um, liquid nitrogen. Basically, it's made up of um, a solid state device that has a PN, um, PN um, couple junctions. And so um, this device can be used for both heating and cooling. So if you, if you reverse the polarity of your um, connected power supply, you can do heating and then you can also do cooling if you, if, if you don't reverse the polarity. So, this is how it looks like. This, this is housed in, in a chamber, which I will show briefly. So this is um, made up of this um, Peltier element coming from the Peltier um, principle, opposite of Seebeck effect. So um, we have this um, copper plate, and then we have this uh, Peltier element, which is our source of heat and cooling. And then we have our heat sink. And then in between these, uh, we have in between these interfaces are uh, um, what we call um, thermal fillers or thermal sheets to ensure that we have good conduction between the, the copper shroud and then also the, uh, the heat sink that will be taking away heat from the, from, from the Peltier element. So this is how it looks like pictorially. So um, this is a very simple um, system, um, element that you can buy. It's available in the market. It costs about um, $200 per, per one. And then um, its maximum current rating is about six amperes and voltage is um, 23 volts. And what we need to care about is when we are running this device, we, we must always be careful not to exceed the maximum temperature difference between the hot surface and then the cold surface. So, because when we exceed that temperature, then the couples would melt and then we will lose um, the device. 
So it is housed in this, um, in this chamber. And this chamber is equipped with a rotary pump and then also a diffusion pump. So the rotary pump is used for roughing and a diffusion pump, which operates based using oil that is heated to about um, 200 degrees Celsius. So by the principle of diffusion, as you, it has no uh, mechanical rotating parts. So this um, system can be built and used anywhere as long as you can have a chamber and then you have a, a stable um, source of DC supply, you can utilize the system for heating and cooling. So um, this is a simple graph of no load um, testing, whereby we, 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 we did some sample testing for um, thermal cycling or thermal balancing. So um, here we did from minus 40 to about um, 70 degrees. And as well within the um, ISO requirements for, um, for CubeSats or NanoSats. And then also um, we, we utilize this um, chamber for testing um, birds 5 EM and also birds 5 FM. The good thing about this is that um, you can see this long stretch over here. Now, when we are doing our, assuming we were using any of the chambers equipped with LN2, we cannot do this because we'll just be wasting liquid nitrogen. But because we don't use um, liquid nitrogen in this, um, in this uh, facility, in this um, equipment, um, this long stretch actually was, was, was a holiday. <laughs> so we just left the thing in the chamber. We went, we came back, and then we continued testing. So this is one of the advantages of this um, device. I'll skip this and then go to um, our, um, our constant um, temperature um, chambers. So assuming you want to um, do thermal shock, whereby you, you, you cycle at a very fast rate, let's say 20 degrees C per minute or 30 degrees C per minute. Yeah, we have equipment that can do that. Yeah, this is not in vacuum though, but we can, it's, 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 it's in atmospheric conditions, but the temperatures and the temperature conditions are quite harsh. So we can do um, shock testing, thermal shock testing. And then this is, can also be used for antenna deployment tests. So sometimes when we are doing our, um, when we are building our in-house um, satellites, the students come here to do the, uh, the uh, antenna deployment test using the dispatch chamber. We, 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 we can also do um, thermal cycling of solar cells and then also of batteries just to check workmanship error. So you can cycle them through, let's say, 50 to about 100 cycles, and then you compare the functionality before and after the test, or you compare certain properties before and after the test to ensure that this will be able to withstand um, the, the harsh environment and space. So we are capable of doing that. And um, our small dispatch chamber can cycle from minus 100 to about plus 200 degrees. And a big dispatch chamber can go from minus 150 to about 260 degrees. So both devices have um, uh, heating elements for heating. And then also we supply liquid nitrogen for, for, for the cooling. So for typical uh, mechanical tests, they, they are categorized as um, strength test and dynamic test. So strength test involves um, quasi-static or pressure proof and burst test. And for dynamic tests, you would have modal survey, um, sinusoidal vibrations, random vibrations, acoustics, and then also shock tests. So the ones in blue, we do here at q -tip. And like once again, depending on the, um, the LSP, the launch service provider, you may be required to meet certain criteria. So land service providers would always um, tell you um, the, the levels at which you should test. And so um, this is a typical level for maybe sinusoidal vibration, and then also for um, random vibration, and then also for, for shock test. So um, yeah, this is a sample graph for, for shock test. So um, these are the specifications of our vibration shaker and our, and our shock equipment. 
So the vibration shaker is capable of about um, 35 um, kilo needs in excitation, um, depending on whether we are doing sinusoidal or random vibration. And then the frequency range is from five to about 2000 Hertz. The maximum displacement is about 60 uh, millimeters. And then the maximum velocity is about 1.25. Uh, maximum loading for vertical and horizontal are 400 and 500 kilogram uh, respectively. But if we want to utilize the machine to its full capacity, then we limit the weight to 50 kg. Yeah. And um, our shock machine is the air bullet type, has a maximum um, pressure, operating pressure of about 0 0.35 um, megapascals. But usually um, the, the shock is activated as around 0 0.23 or 0 0.26 max um, megapascal. Okay. And then also we do um, outgassing. We have an outgassing equipment that um, is um, standardized for um, the ASTM E595 um, testing qualification platform. And so we are able to, for outgassing, um, the launcher would want to know whether your system doesn't release any um, harmful substances that could interfere with the operation of the app. Uh, rocket or that could interfere with the operation of other um, um, payload that is on board. So sometimes, most of the time, you are required to show that your material um, will not exceed 1% um, total mass loss or 0.1% um, CVCM, which is, um, I think it is, um, <laughs> um, this is a collectible volatile con condensed material, yeah. So it should not exceed 0.1%. And then we also have an, an anechoic chamber where we, we do um, the EMC test. And then also we can check um, your antenna pattern. And um, these are some sample pictures. And you can see recently some birds five students um, setting up the space to do the, uh, um, the EMC for the satellite. Anyway, so this is all that I have for today. I would like to show some videos if we have time, probably a one minute or um, one minute video each for both um, shock test, um, random and then sign vibration. But before we do that, if there are any questions, please feel free and ask your questions or you can also type them in the chat box. So Maida Sensei, can I go ahead and show the video or we can do some questions first? Now let's see the videos. Okay, just a moment. Okay, let's do um, shock test first. Can you hear the sound? No. No sound is coming. No. <laughs> okay, just a moment. Why there's no sound? Uh, but you can see the video, right? Yes, yes. Okay, I don't know why sound is not coming, but anyway. Can you do so, the sound for us? <laughs> Hello? So, okay, so from here, you, you saw that there was, so, this is a component being tested and there's, there is the bullet beneath here. So when the bullet is released, it impacts the base of this jig and then the impact is sent to the test components. Unfortunately, the sound is not showing. So um, let's also show- uh, well, well, wait, So wait a second, mm. when, when does the shock occur? The shock just happened around this place. Uh, so it's difficult to see the bullet from here because it's beneath this. <laughs> but do you see there is some bright light, there's some, some kind of waves? Yeah. 
you can see this when when it impacts you see this flare <laughs> ah, okay yeah okay <coughs> and then sinusoidal vibration so just see how it is going to vibrate So this is a component that will be used in another satellite and it has a lot of fiber cables. And we were testing this under very strenuous um, conditions. So the frequency increases. How many dimensions is this shaking? This is shaking in only um, one dimension. So this was only, I think, in the x-axis direction. Uh, but of course, we can do the test for all the axes. We just have to rotate the, either the shaker or we just have to change the in-plane axis of the test component. And then also my last video will be random vibration. So the same components, but just random. So three dimensions. Yeah, this was done for 23, no, I think 20 G GRMS. Very high for this component. <coughs> okay, so that is that for the for the for the videos. So if you have any questions, please um, feel free to ask me one or two questions. Let me check the chats. Yes, the uh, floor is open for questions. I think Prof. Cho answered most of the chat questions. Okay, okay. Please go ahead with questions. Today, uh, in, we introduce a uh, QTEC uh, activity, but uh, we hope to introduce other Japanese universities as well. Uh, because uh, JCube, it's not limited to, to a partnership with uh, QTEC only. So, uh, we, so far, only a small number of uh, Japanese universities uh, work with uh, foreign uh, uh, countries like uh, Tohoku, University, Hokkaido University, Stock University, and uh, QTEC and uh, KEO. But uh, we want to expand that once to more to uh, Japanese, other Japanese universities as well. Because uh, one idea is to promote uh, uh, internationalization or globalization of uh, Japanese uh, university. So um, we, we try to invite other Japanese universities in the future, uh, JQ. JQ so Miyata Sensei, any uh, candidates for future talks? Sorry, not decided yet, but uh, uh, now we are organizing as a as a ten, as a participant. Okay, because um, the next one's in June, and so far uh, it, it's blank. <laughs> no, no one has raise their hands. So I, I hope uh, more Japanese universities will raise their hands. Yeah, yeah, I understand the situation, so. Hello, good afternoon, here in Nigeria. Yeah, Go ahead. Please, um, yeah, please, my question goes to Professor Chu. He is concerning about um, these um, financial ability of uh, participating uh, 
or agency or country. So, uh, because we have from your presentation, you have met us to, to know that um, the launching of the satellite is free. So, I was asking what is the um, financial condition of the people that want to participate on this X Amina yes, uh, scheme? That was my question I asked. Well, because you have to have a very solid financial plan to support uh, your satellite project. Uh, the launch price uh, in this uh, J cube is much lower than uh, uh, money to be spent in a satellite, actual satellite hardware. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, when you start a satellite project, you must have overall financial plan. Uh, including launch, but the launch is not uh, such a big part. So, uh, any important thing is a secure the budget. Yes. Yes. Uh, and uh, secure the budget for the satellite. And uh, add something extra, small part uh, for the launch. Is my answer. <laughs> It's, it's, it's okay. Um, yeah. Another question I might ask is, uh, how can we assess this application form? Because I know our next meeting will be on June. And the period that you gave here uh, is between May to December. Yes. So, uh, so, so uh, to, to fill the application, you need to find a pattern. Okay. To, to make applications, you need to find a Japanese pattern. Yes, and uh, to have a Japanese partner, to find the Japanese partner, UNICEF uh, is a point of contact. So uh, in our official website, uh, you see uh, in a uh, chat message. In official website, in a chat message, uh, you know how to contact uh, UNICEF regarding this directive. And uh, UNICEF will assist you to find a uh, Japanese partner. Okay. Tanaka, am I correct? Yes, actually, yes. I have uh, made some comment on, on chat. Mm. So if you have any questions about JCube or matchmaking system, you can contact us by email. Yes, I, I think that's perfect. Yes. Okay. Yes. So any questions, uh, please send your questions to this uh, info, Jcube, Ustec, JP. They are happy to answer. Any more questions? May I ask a question? Go ahead. Hello. Uh, what should be the status of the development of the CubeSat? It could be like, early stages of requirement analysis, so it has to be very, very advanced. Uh, I think I, not much, uh, it's not really required. It can be just on paper. Yes, it's okay. But uh, we need, uh, at least you need to define the mission and uh, how satellite looks like, yes. And uh, also, of course, most, most important, you have to secure the budget. Also, you have to secure the people. And uh, satellite can be uh, on paper. But uh, the, at least uh, those are the missions, how satellite look like, and uh, people and money. Is it okay? Yes, thank you. And the general timeline to do the development with the Japanese uh, university, it's like one, two uh, years or how many years? Uh, yes, it's up to you. Yes, uh, the, after, after having a launch contract with JAXA, we have to go through uh, the safety review of the satellite. And uh, well, unless miracle happens, uh, it will take at least uh, six months, please. Yes. And uh, well, if you have uh, your satellite already <laughs> made, 
and ready for flight. We still have to go through the safety review. And uh, that, pro that times, may, well, the, yeah, I think you can anticipate six months. Or you can shorten to three months if you are really perfect, but uh, I don't think uh, it will occur. So uh, six months is a minimum. Yes, six months Thank is a minimum. So yes. And uh, typically one year to two years. And, and things go much more smoothly when you send students to QTEC because they assist with the development. There are some uh, questions in the chat. Uh, the safety review requirement for JAXA are provided in advance before building the satellite. Uh, that is intended to be deployed. Well, I think, uh, uh, no, uh, I think you need to follow uh, J, uh, JAXA uh, uh, Gen Payload Accommodation Handbook. Yes. And, uh, Safety review, uh, safety review process starts only after we have the uh, uh, those, uh, launch contract. And the requirement, uh, detailed requirement is not in the public domain. So uh, I think uh, you need to consult with the uh, Japanese partner and uh, to know, uh, those partner knows uh, what are the requirement typically because uh, they have some experience uh, dealing with JAXA. So, but uh, always uh, requirement uh, keeps changing. So the latest ones will be disclosed only after the uh, only after uh, the launch quarter. The other two questions, uh, if any countries develop a payload, not the whole satellite and want to do partnership with Japan University to host the payload, in that case, it will be okay or for JQ partnership policy? I think yes. I think that is okay. So uh, the foreign partners build a uh, payload, Japanese partner build a satellite. I think uh, it fits. Can it be one you as well? What does this mean? Here. I, I don't understand the, the question. That's the question by the Angel Arcia. We cannot hear you. Please unmute. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. I didn't catch your question. What do you mean? Can it be a uh, can it be one you as well? You type the questions in the chat message. Hello? Hello? Well, <laughs> Angel, are you there? Yeah, sorry, I just got disconnected. My question was related to the size of the CubeSat. Uh, yeah, it yeah. has to be three units necessarily, or it can be one or two units? Oh, uh, yeah, it's either one U, two U, or three U. Yes. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? I guess there are no more questions. Okay. So again, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, send the email to info uh, jq at UNSEC JP. And please, uh, they spread this uh, new uh, schemes to, to your friends. <laughs> yes, because uh, the, we, we really want to promote this idea. So we have plenty of slots. Uh, yes, six satellite, 12 wheel, four, yes. 
can you summarize the schedule for this year? Uh, application starts in May and uh, deadline is December. So uh, to apply, you need to find a Japanese partner. To find a Japanese partner, contact UNICEF. Yes. Um, actually, the deadline of matchmaking registration is the earlier than the deadline of JCAP application. So mm -hmm. um, please be noted that. Yes. Yeah, because you cannot uh, you cannot have a partner uh, one week before the application deadline. <laughs> uh, there's another question in chat. Does the partnership with UNICEF have to be aligned to a satellite development or specific launch? Well, uh, well, it can. You can just simply. Build a satellite and ask for the launch. But uh, in that case, you have to think what the Japanese university can gain by assisting you. So it must be win win condition. So. As I said, Japanese university is, is not a launch broker. They are not doing for the profit. So they must gain something. Professor Roman, did you raise your hand? Yes. If I may, I have a, a short comment. Um, first of all, um, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting presentation. It's a, a, it's a fantastic opportunity for developing countries. I'd just like to mention that in May, we will have a meeting in Quito of the IIS Developing Countries uh, Committees that I now um, they, they nominated me as a chair of this, of this uh, committee. And I want to put uh, this opportunity in the agenda. I will uh, contact you later on to, be, to, to see how we can have a, a, a presentation of this opportunity for the, it's, it's about 40 countries in the committee, in the developing countries uh, committee of the IAF. Um, I think Uh, Director Roman, are you there? Well, another question, do you need to develop your satellite before seeking a Japanese partner? No. Paper can be on paper. Uh, no, sorry. Satellite can be on paper, just on paper. However, as I said, you need to secure money, people, and um, uh, also define mission. Hello, I, I don't know if you hear me. Yes. Uh, did you hear my 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 question? I, I think I lost a little bit the the signal. Uh, yeah, I think we catched uh, the most of what you said. Yes. Uh, you, you put the difference on the agenda of IAF committee. Oh, okay, perfect, perfect. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. We would like to wrap this up. Uh, so if there's any question, please ask now. Um, excuse me, Mada Sensei, can I have a question? Sure, go ahead. Um, um, hi, Mada Sensei, F. Cho Sensei. Um, uh, just now, um, for the first presentation by Cho Sensei, regarding the important points where we have to have 
the clear definition of responsibilities in SOW. So, um, so like we are currently developing a satellite, um, and we haven't have any, I believe, MOU yet with um, Kitai or any Japanese university, university. So, in order to do so for this JQ uh, application, is it too late for us, Sensei? To is apply it, for this program. Sorry, say again. Is it too? Too late. Um, is it late for us to, to apply for this JQ application? Because just now you said that we need to have the um, involvement from Japanese institution for this yeah. program. Yeah, yeah so, so you, you need to find a partner. Yeah. Okay, so um, and the Japanese, Japanese institution needs also to have their clear definition for the responsibility in SOW. Am I right, Dr. Uh, Sensei? Yeah, so uh, I think that the definition will come while you discuss with uh, those possible partners. Mm, understood. Thank you. Have you decided how you're going to launch? Uh, before this, we are going to have the uh, typical uh, cable cube, uh, Maida Sensei, but um, this check also really tempting. <laughs> but uh, we need to discuss with um, uh, Prof. Saimi first for this. Opportunity. No, I think JCube is much, much better for you. Yeah, yeah. So I don't understand why you asked the question, is it too late? It, it's not too late. It's not too late. Okay, thank you. I'm afraid it's too late. Okay, Maida, Sensei, I understand. Thank you very much. Okay, Professor Cho, shall we wrap this up? Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah. Okay, thank you everyone for attending. Um, we will send out information about the next uh, webinar in June. So, um, goodbye from, from uh, QTech in Japan. Thank you. Goodbye. Good night. Good night. Thank you.